Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our service for the second Sunday of Easter. I am Pastor Curtis Aguirre of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Penticton, British Columbia. Lorraine Cameron is here today as the organist. Let's begin right away with a hymn. Uh, the hymn is The Day of Resurrection, number 361 in the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Books, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 4. eternal God, the strength of those who believe, and the hope of those who doubt. May we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessings, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 to 31. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today is the second Sunday of the season of Easter, the Sunday on which we traditionally hear this story of, quote-unquote, doubting Thomas. This story is usually held up as a story about faith and doubt, but I think it can also be seen as a story of healing. But to see it that way, we also have to rethink what we mean by healing. We often treat healing as a thing, an act, like a miraculous reversal of the aging process or a get-out-of-jail-free card from the consequences of an unhealthy lifestyle or a magical shield from the consequences of exposure to toxic substances or a genetic code patch to avoid the working out of our genetic predisposition. That's usually how we think of healing. What we are thinking of here, however, is not healing so much as curing. Curing is something you do to meat and fruit to keep out the rot. We use the word cure by way of analogy to this health process, but really, when we deal with disease, we're talking about healing about making whole again, restoring as much as possible. Life is about birth and growth and change and experience and danger and response to danger, including injury, disease and loss, and eventually death. That is what it means to live, to experience all these things. When we talk about healing, we do not mean avoiding all these parts of life by freezing a moment of wellness. Rather, what we're talking about is being whole in the midst of brokenness. And that takes a change of thinking. As I've thought about the subject of healing over the years, I've come to realize that healing is itself a way of looking at the world. It's a way of seeing things, a way of thinking about life and relationships, and a way of relating to God. Healing, from a Christian perspective, is at least, and maybe at its core, a state of mind or a particular awareness of reality. 
So let's look at our reading from John for today. As I said, the story of doubting Thomas is usually held up up as a story about doubt and faith, but look at it through the lens of healing and, and, and it becomes a different kind of story. You may remember that when Lazarus had died and Jesus was about to go to Judea where his disciples knew Jesus was a wanted man, Thomas was the one who said, let us go with him that we may die with him. In other words, Thomas was prepared to face death with his master. But when Jesus was arrested and the actual moment came for Thomas to show his loyalty, he ran like the others and hid. So imagine his frame of mind in today's reading. He is deeply wounded by his own guilt, his sense of failure, his feelings of inadequacy, not to mention his grief at having lost his master, this amazing teacher and healer named Jesus, whom he had followed for for the last three years. Though Thomas may have no wounds in his body, he bears deep wounds of the soul. Then the others suddenly claim to have seen Jesus risen. It can't be. It's a joke, a cruel, practical joke. Stop it, you guys, he says. I believe it when I touch his wounds. Now Thomas also suffers from being alienated from the rest of his fellow disciples. He is alone with his pain. Then, when Jesus appears to Thomas in the company of the others, a whole set of healings take place at once. Thomas knows he is forgiven for his cowardice. His grief is healed and he is reintegrated into his circle of friends. Of course, his failure to act is still there in his past, in his memory, Jesus' suffering and death are still there in his memory as well, and life in community is always hard work. But this story about Jesus appearing to Thomas is not just a story about doubt and faith. It's also an image of healing and restoration. There is nothing physically wrong with Thomas, but inside he was broken, wounded, sick to the soul. Forgiveness and acceptance by Jesus are a big part of Thomas's healing. In traditional Christian rites of healing, the service usually begins with an act of confession and forgiveness. Now, this can be misconstrued as saying that the person suffering is some sort of punishment from God, but what this, is, what this really taps into is the insight that when we feel bad about ourselves, or when we feel rejected by God, or alienated from God, or when we feel like failures, we become spiritually broken. And when our spirits are broken, it doesn't take long for that brokenness to manifest itself in physical maladies. In fact, many young people, and probably many who are not so young, will do things like self-harm, cutting and so on, because the physical pain helps to distract them from the emotional pain. And emotional pain is a form of spiritual pain. Or to put it another way, the physical pain is easier to bear than the emotional pain. And here's the clue to understanding the power of spiritual healing. The physically healthiest person in the world can still suffer deep inner pain, and a dying person can find deep inner peace. And here is also where we come around to faith and doubt. The story of Thomas and the risen Jesus is a story of inner healing, but it is one that plays itself out in the context of faith. In this time of physical separation that we live in now, of economic uncertainty, of plans put on hold and hopes delayed, the healing that comes from faith 
is more important than ever. Faith is a little like a skill. I know that it comes as a gift from God, but it is a living gift, like a plant, and it needs to be watered and fed for it to thrive and bloom. Or to go back to the skill analogy, like any gift, say, musicality or the ability to make things or cook or fix things, the, things that make, the thing that makes you, takes you up to the next level is practice, practice, Practice. 10,000 hours, they say, will make you an expert. Faith is no different. It needs prayer. It needs study in the scriptures and teaching from those who pass on the faith. It needs times of reflection. It needs the encouragement of other believers. And it needs challenges. Faith is tested by facing challenges. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul uses the analogy of an athlete, saying that just as an athlete trains for the competition, we also must train for the challenges of the life of faith. In Philippians 3, 12 to 14, he talks about pressing on toward the goal and straining forward to what lies ahead. When we train and prepare our faith in this way, It is like building up our immune systems, our spiritual immune systems, so that when challenges come, we are ready to face them. So I can only urge you on to take up your faith, to work with it, to build it up, so that as it says at the end of today's reading, through believing, you may have life in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together our next hymn. It's number 612 in the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Books, Healer of Our Every Ill, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Let us now offer our prayers using the shorter litany found in the Evangelical Lutheran worship books, 
on pages 316 to 317. In peace let us pray to the Lord For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord For the health of the creation, for abundant harvests that all may share, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord have mercy. For public servants, the government, and those who protect us, for those who work to bring peace, justice, healing, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord For those who travel, for those who are sick and suffering, for those who are in captivity, let us pray to the Lord For deliverance in the time of affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord have mercy. For all servants of the Church, for this assembly, and for all people who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord have Let us now take a moment to offer our own prayers. giving thanks for all who have gone before us and are at rest. Rejoicing in the communion of all the saints, we commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to you through Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.